We have a very uh, wonderful guest here with us today to address us is Dr. Peter Krasnevsky. I understand he hails from Chicago and grew up in New Jersey, but we won't hold that against him. <laughs> As a matter of fact, some of our uh, very memorable speakers over the years, and I'm sure this will be no different, have come from south of the border, and we're very grateful for that. Peter holds a BA in liberal arts from, from uh, Thomas Aquinas College in California. He has an MA and a PhD in philosophy from the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. After teaching at the International Theological Institute in Austria, and for the Franciscan University of Steubenville's Austrian program, he joined the founding team of Wyoming Catholic College in Lander, Wyoming, where he serves as professor and choir master. He's a board member and scholar of the Thomas Aquinas Institute for the Study of Sacred Doctrine, which is publishing the Opera Omnia of the Angelic Doctor and a fellow of the Albertus Magnus Center for Scholastic Studies. Kwasniewski has taught and written several hundred articles on Thomistic thought, sacramental and liturgi liturgical theology, the history and aesthetics of music, and the social doctrine of the church. He's published two books with the Catholic University of America Press and a volume of music for liturgical use, that Sacred Choral Works, Corpus Christi, Watershed 2014, so that's very recent. His latest book, Resurgent in the Midst of Crisis, Sacred Liturgy, the Traditional Latin Mass, and Renewal in the Church, also Angelical Press, 2014. It's being translated into Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, French, German, Polish, and Czech. And Canadian, eh? <laughs> Would you give them a good, warm Vancouver or BC welcome? Thank you very much uh, for having me here today. Um, I just want to say before I begin that it's very inspiring to me, very encouraging to me to see all of you here, to see what you're doing in Vancouver and in Canada. Um, I, I think that now it's more important than ever to promote the traditional Latin Mass uh, and everything traditional, the traditional catechism, traditional doctrine, St. Thomas Aquinas, um, uh, all the sacraments and sacramentals, uh, because we are really, I think, in a period of um, a kind of accelerating tailspin, uh, culturally, theologically, intellectually, culturally, um, and and this this is the the anchor that is going to hold us in place. But I'm going to comment on that in my talk, so maybe I shouldn't get ahead of myself here. Um, so thank you for all that you're doing. Um, it's very encouraging. Reverend Fathers and Friends in Christ, I dedicate my lecture today to Our Lady of Victories and to our saint, Pope St. Martin I. Rather than compromise one bit with error, as Pope Honorius had shamefully done about 15 years earlier, St. Martin, whom we celebrated today, energetically opposed the Monothelite heresy on account of which he was abducted by command of the Byzantine emperor, exiled, imprisoned, and banished. Having died of exhaustion, he is revered as a martyr by both Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. He exemplifies how a pope is supposed to behave towards heresies, regardless of threats or punishments from the mighty of this world. In the record of sacred scripture, the Blessed Virgin Mary is a woman of few words and few appearances. But the words she speaks and the role she plays are of such a depth that never in a thousand centuries would their wisdom and fecundity be exhausted. And for all eternity, their echoes will sound and resound in the heavenly places. It can be said without exaggeration that Mary's words and actions summarize the entire Christian life. They present the very pattern or archetype of that life. 
They are the whole of ascetical mystical theology in nucleo. If we had nothing but Our Lady's sayings and deeds, we would still know from them how to be perfect followers of Christ. We would have the pith or marrow of the gospel. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, that we can also find in them a guide to the spirituality of the liturgy, namely, to the correct internal dispositions and external actions of the formal, public, solemn prayer of the Church, by which we most perfectly exercise our baptismal share in Christ's priesthood and receive the fruits of his redemption, becoming those worshippers of God in spirit and in truth that the Father desires. Because of their very depth of meaning, Our Lady's words and deeds are too vast a topic for one lecture. Um, even as I was working on this, I kept thinking, oh, no, I better not talk about that. It'll, ta- it'll take me in another direction. So I think this needs, this needs a book, actually, uh, or 10 or 20 or 50. I will therefore limit myself to her words at the Annunciation, her silent, interior, but supremely active participation at the foot of the cross, and her poignant words at the wedding feast of Cana. So that will be the the three parts of my talk. At the Annunciation. When the Archangel St. Gabriel announces to the Blessed Virgin that she is to bear a son, her reaction indicates, without any doubt, that she had already consecrated herself to perpetual virginity. How shall this be done? Because I know not man. Pregnancy is impossible, it seems to Mary, for she has no intention of knowing a man. Otherwise, she would have assumed that the angel was speaking about a son to be born from her wedlock with St. Joseph. The angel replies, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. And therefore also the Holy which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. In other words, this offspring will not be the result of a man's action, the son of a man, but will be formed by a direct action of the Holy Spirit, a fruit of the Creator's omnipotence, and therefore worthy to be called the offspring of God himself. In this exchange, there is a profound liturgical lesson for us. The Catholic Church is often spoken of as the mystical body of Christ, as the extension in space and time of the mystery of the Incarnation. Something similar can be said of the sacred liturgy, It is Christ among us. It is the brightness of his glory and the figure of his substance, as he is of the Father. Through it, the mysteries of the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord are made present and effective in our midst. The Lord himself touches us, body and soul, to heal and elevate us. The liturgy, too, is the offspring of God in our midst, formed over long centuries by the brooding of the Holy Spirit upon the surface of human waters, It is not a mere construct of human hands, a product of man's initiative or labor or great ideas, but rather the unmerited gift of God poured into our messy history as charity is poured into our sinful hearts and making something beautiful out of our nature for our salvation. The liturgy is born from the womb of the church, our mother, by the power of the Most High overshadowing her. As we see in both Testaments, liturgy comes about primarily by God's intervention, impregnating his bride with the seed of the word. The liturgy is born from the church's virginal receptivity, and she retains her integrity and her honor in conceiving, giving birth, and mothering her child. If this is true about the innermost essence of the liturgy, it follows that it is a fundamental error to think of the liturgy as if it were, first and foremost, the work of human hands, the offspring of our genius, our skills, our pastoral programs, as if we were the begetters of it, having the rights of a parent over it. Rather, the liturgy comes from God, from the eternal liturgy of the heavenly Jerusalem. It belongs to God alone, who entrusts it to our hands for safekeeping. It returns to God, and we return to him through it, bearing our sheaves from the harvest, our increase of talents for his glory. The church as virgin bride says to God, how shall my liturgy come forth because I know not a man who can beget it? And God answers her, it is not for any man or any committee to form this liturgy. It is mine alone in the hidden womb of the ages 
the fruit of countless holy men and women moved by the Spirit of God, who first humbly receive, who, according to their capacity, adorn and enrich this patrimony, and who then faithfully transmit all the gifts they have received. In truth, Holy Mother Church never has the intention of knowing a man, that is, treating the liturgy as a choice made by partners in family planning, or worse, as a man-made product that can be modified at will, deconstructed and reconstructed as if it were a machine or a building or a toy. She rather conserves and preserves the holy seed entrusted to her, utterly subordinating, subordinating herself to it, treating it with the same reverence with which she would wash and anoint the Savior's very body, as she lovingly and fearfully touches the flesh and blood of God. Returning now to the scene of the Annunciation, we see Our Lady giving her fiat, on which the entire salvation of the world hinges. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. Note the double passivity of this statement. She does not say, I will do thus and such. She says, be it done unto me. Moreover, she does not say, be it done unto me according to my words, or be it done unto me as I understand it, as if she were entering into a contract between equals in which both parties have worked out a mutual formula of agreement. No, she says, according to thy word. She does not grasp everything that this word contains or demands or portends. In fact, she knows that she is consenting to that which is absolutely beyond her understanding and surrenders to it. One is reminded of the last words of Mother Catherine Mechtild de Bar, I adore and I submit. In the words of Dionysius the Areopagite, the perfect theologian not only learns but suffers divine things. The Blessed Virgin exemplifies this suffering of divine things. She lets them happen to her. She accepts, receives, embraces, and this is why she becomes pregnant with God. He is able to enter into her fully, substantially, because she gives herself, her humanity, her heart, soul, mind, and strength completely to him. God does wonders in creation in proportion to the aptitude for wonders that he finds in the creature. We may almost rephrase Mary's response, make me suffer according to thy word. Refashion me, transform me according to thy word. This formula illuminates the immensely powerful spirituality of the traditional liturgy of the church, whether Eastern or Western. The liturgy as such is given to us as a word of infinite density, as the pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty as a logos to be embodied in our midst, in our churches, on our altars, in our souls, in our actions. In imitation of the Theotokos, we are to become bearers of this word which we receive. We do not make or create or fashion this word, but like Mary, we receive it from another, we suffer it, and are thus transformed by it as potency is fulfilled by actuality. Hence, for the liturgy to be Marian, for it to change us into her image, it must not, I repeat, must not be subject to the will of the celebrant. It cannot be full of options, variations, adaptations, extemporaneous utterances, improvisations. As Joseph Ratzinger has rightly said, the greatness of the liturgy depends on its unspontaneity. The novelty of having options to choose from in the Missal, as if one were partaking of a devotional buffet, the novelty of allowing celebrants to build from modules and to improvise at various points of the Mass, a malleability that some liturgists identify and praise as the single most characteristic feature of the Reformed Roman liturgy, changes the fundamental character of worship in a radical way. Instead of expressing the Marian stance, be it done unto me according to thy word, it expresses a distinctively modern stance of crea creativity, autonomy, and volunteerism. I will do it according to my mind, my choice, and my words. Or as Frank Sinatra colloquially crooned, I'll do it my way. When Lucifer cried out, I will not serve, he might just as well have said, I will not submit to a predetermined plan. 
I will not conform myself to a heavenly pattern. <clears throat> Lucifer's anti-Marian stance, epitomized in his rebellious cry, I will not serve, assumes many forms in the course of history. In the ecclesiastical sphere, it takes on the form of, I will not preserve, I will not conserve. Lucifer is the original liberal, inasmuch as he spurns order, discipline, rule, rubric, and tradition. He will not pass along something that came from another. Everything has to be from himself, even if it is poor, banal, and ugly. What a stark contrast with Mary's ecce ancilla domini. She knows that she is not the master. She is the ancilla, the slave girl. So much for modern Catholics who take the words of Jesus out of context. I no longer call you servants, but friends, and conclude that we are not servants in any way. His mother, the holiest of all human persons, and the most intimate friend of Christ, calls herself an ancilla, because she knows more and loves more than those who do not wish to belong completely to another. The word demon comes from a Greek word meaning one who divides. Satan is a divider. One way he has lived up to this title is by dividing Catholics from our own heritage, our own tradition. This suits well his liberal agenda, which is to convince each generation that it is autonomous from past generations, and to convince each individual that he is autonomous from God, his fellow man, and his ancestors. The devil is permanently rootless, utterly without roots. That is why he goes prowling about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. And he wants to uproot the rest of us. His greatest victory is not to hook us on pornography, alcohol, or drugs. Those things are wicked, to be sure, and have destroyed many lives. But worse by far is the cutting us off from the likelihood of conversion and contemplation by severing us from the Catholic tradition in, in which we will find all the medicine, the food and drink, the clothing that we need for the healing of our sicknesses and the living of a godly life. The liturgy, and therefore the church herself, will not become healthy again, or if she seems to be healthy in some places, will not be able to maintain that condition against the increasingly violent and demonic assaults of modernity, until the clergy have submitted to the logos, expressed in her perfectly evolved traditional liturgical rites, with their stability of form, soundness of formulas, inexhaustible treasury of holy prayers, resounding orthodoxy, transcendent orientation, and otherworldly beauty. This too is what St. Paul says, follow the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me in faith, Guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Formam habe sanorum verborum bonum depositum custodi. When the liturgical rite demands the celebrant's complete submission to its prayers, gestures, and ceremonies, it swallows him up like Jonah's fish and hides him within its spacious confines so that he disappears into the bright blaze of Christ. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. When the celebrant completely submits himself to such a rite, he enters into the kenosis, the self-emptying of Christ. He most of all becomes alter Christus, mediating between mutable man and the immutable God. He practices the humility of St. John the Baptist, who said, He must increase, I must decrease. Hence, the vital importance of recovering the traditional orientation of the priest, who, when the time of sacrifice arrives, should be facing east, together with the people he is leading to Christ. It is the very inflexibility of traditional liturgical forms that gives them their indomitable power to shape us, to change us, to be our fixed reference point, to be the rock on which the anchor of our restless hearts can catch hold. We who are so unstable so wrapped up in our shifting emotions and poor thoughts, need an unshifting basis of prayer, rich and resonant with the accumulated piety and wisdom of the ages. Only in this way do we come to calmness, arriving at a harbor that mirrors our eternal haven. Only in this way can we put ourselves back together, so to speak, and achieve a wholeness that left to our own devices we could never hope to enjoy. 
The perennial liturgy is a source of sanity and stability for a church storm-tossed, vexed with heresy, harassed by temptations of compromise with the world, the flesh, and the devil. It is a pearl of great price, even in the most peaceful of times, but in an age of confusion and wickedness like ours, it is an urgently needed ark of safety, a fortress of truth, a tower of strength, a beacon of light. We may apply to it the words of the epistle to the Hebrews. Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. We can adapt and apply to the traditional liturgy the words with which the Book of Wisdom describes its namesake. She is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entry into her. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God and an image of his goodness. Though she is but one, she can do all things. And while remaining in herself, she renews all things. In every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. That's Book of Wisdom, chapter 7. Liturgy rightly understood is the breath of God's power, an emanation of his glory, giving us a foretaste of that glory and guiding us to the promised land. Nothing defiled, disordered, erroneous, heretical, or harmful can gain entrance into the liturgical rites of Catholic tradition, organically built up by the Holy Spirit and preserved from corruption, as was Mary's virginity. The liturgy reflects the one who called himself the light of the world. It spotlessly mirrors Christ by presenting his mysteries not as empty commemorations, but as efficacious signs that unite us immediately and directly to their substantial reality. In this way, the earthly liturgy, although limited in time and place, can do all things that Christ himself did and does, renewing everything else by remaining itself and by remaining true to itself. Through the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the divine office, the sacraments and sacramentals, eternal and incarnate wisdom passes into holy souls of every generation and makes them friends of God and prophets. The foremost of these holy souls and friends of God is Our Lady. Just as St. John the Baptist was a prophet and more than a prophet, so too Our Lady is more than a participant in the liturgy. In her very person, she is a living liturgy, the vessel through which our Lord deigned to enter into space and time, to take on flesh and blood in our midst. She became the bridge between heaven and earth, God and man. She is not a priest, but rather the very condition of the possibility of the priesthood, even in a way of her own son's priesthood. Her divine motherhood makes her greater than any ministerial priest, greater than any bishop or pope, and yet totally other than a priest, simply not in the same category as members of the church's hierarchy. She gives birth to the hierarchy, nurses it, educates it, leads it, wraps her protecting mantle around it. The whole of the church is a child in the womb of Mary, in the arms of Mary. She is far greater than our structures. She is the very essence and meaning and purpose and goodness of our structures. And women are privileged to bear in their very womanhood a natural likeness to Our Lady, which, under the influence of grace, is capable of becoming a supernatural likeness. This is why clamoring for the involvement or activity of women in the sanctuary, whether as priests, which is impossible, or as deaconesses, which is equivocal and confusing, to say the least, or even merely as functionaries in a plethora of minor roles, is not simply a matter of mistaken priorities, but an assault on the metaphysics of God, the logic of the incarnation, the ethics of our Marian response, and the poetics of the liturgical act. It too is a way of saying non serviam. I will not serve the relationship of father and son, the descending agency of the logos, the reception of tradition, or the natural and supernatural symbolism of the rites. I will not serve the supremacy of Mary and the woman's virginal maternal role in the order of creation. I will not serve the supremacy of Christ and the man's vicarious role in the order of redemption. 
I will not serve the very distinction of sexes that makes possible the revelation of God's preferential passionate love and the eruption into our world of the miraculum miraculorum, the incarnation of the word. The eternal contradiction of Satan's attitude is Our Lady's fiat, be it done unto me according to thy word. This fiat takes on a specific profile for each category of Christian. For the laity, our fiat is to receive, to love, and to live the liturgical forms of our tradition, and not to think that it is a matter of indifference which logos we are receiving, one that comprises all ages or one that derives from modernity. For women, the fiat consists in receiving and submitting to the order of the liturgy, which impresses upon us ever more deeply the virginal, bridal, and maternal character of the Christian life, and of Our Lady in particular. All Christians receive and live this Marian identity, but women are privileged to do so existentially, in a bodily way that makes them living sacraments of Mary's divine maternity, something no male human no male human being can be. For men, on the other hand, this fiat includes the possibility that we would be summoned by our Lord to receive a share in his priestly power and to represent and exercise his priesthood at the altar of sacrifice. In responding to this call, we are not ceasing to be Marian, but living out her attitude to the fullest. We are not becoming agents of change or actors in a modern sense, but rather patients of change, ones who will be changed into the image of Christ by ordination and by the discipline of the sacred liturgy. <coughs> the fiat of the clergy and anyone who serves as a liturgical theologian, educator, or minister of any kind is to suffer the liturgy to be itself and to form us rather than acting upon it and forming it, as if we were still walking around in the apostolic age and had the charisms of the early church in its embryonic phase, in its pre-Constantinian secrecy, prior to the robust development of public, solemn, formal worship that culminated in the liturgical rites of the Byzantine Empire and of the medieval Latin church. Such perfected liturgical rites are the plenary manifestation of the word, incarnatus de spiritu sancto, to which we are bound by filial piety, by the very fact of our belonging to the perfect society of the church, continuously one and visible until the end of time. The priest, more than anyone else, is called to be not an actor, but a transmitter, a transparent communicator of wisdom that is not his own, a borrowed voice of Christ and the church. As we said before, his entire attitude in ministry, and especially at the altar, should reflect those words of the Baptist, speaking of our Lord. He must increase and I must decrease. Or in the words of the Book of Wisdom, the priest is a breath of God's power, a reflection, a mirror, an image. He is not the reality itself, but participates in it. He must therefore at all costs avoid liturgical and extra-liturgical activism, which expresses an attitude of self-absorbed Promethean Neopelagian domination that is utterly contrary to Marian spirituality. <coughs> Activism here includes the many forms of liturgical manipulation, exploitation, and narcissism that have marred the face of the Bride of Christ and crippled her work during the past half century, as well as forms of clericalism that interfere with the laity's zealous fulfillment of their own social, political, and cultural responsibilities. For male and female religious, the fiat of Our Lady is the very model of one's entire way of life as a liturgical being who, by God's grace, has chosen to live as much as possible for and from the Eucharistic body of Christ, and consequently for those members of the mystical body of Christ who are in most need of one's prayers, sacrifices, and works of mercy. Religious are called above and before all else to the corporate praise of God in a solemn and splendid way such that the rest of the church can catch fire from their zeal for the opus dei, the worship of God. Christians who are lukewarm, distracted, even well-intentioned but superficial, are often brought to conversion by the potent witness of a community of monks, nuns, or friars offering up the sacrifice of praise, 
which makes manifest that God is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and abiding reality for us and for all human beings. The religious could be described as a person who, having received through no merits of his own, the grace of a penetrating awareness of his total dependence on God, has decided to live out this dependence as fully as he can, ordering everything else to this goal, and thereby carrying many others with him. Religious are the ones awake in a world of sleepwalkers. The church depends especially on them to be generously devoted to the Opus Dei, alert to the message of liturgical symbols, responsive to the gravitational pull of tradition. In this way, they serve to anchor and orient the rest of the people of God. To everyone, Our Lady shows us that action proceeds from contemplation and returns to it, that any work we can do for God must be suspended like a bridge between the fixed points of liturgical prayer and personal prayer, that our hectic labor must be oriented to holy leisure, even as this earthly pilgrimage is for the sake of our eternal destiny. The Virgin Mary was not like St. Martha, busy about many things and complaining that she never got any help. Rather, as St. Luke says, Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. For her, what mattered most was the unchanging truth of God and its reflection on the face of Jesus. To this, she gently but firmly directed everything else. She was ad orientem, through and through. In our interior attitude towards liturgy, in our actual practice of worship, and in the ordering of our lives, we should imitate and internalize this theocentric and Christocentric orientation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Where do we see this Marian orientation most of all? Stabat mater dolorosa, juxta crucem lacrimosa, dum pendebat filius. Standing beneath the cross was the sorrowful mother weeping while her son was hanging there. Fac ut ardeat cormeum in amando Christum Deum ut sibi complaceam. Inflame my heart with love for Christ God, that I may, that I may be pleasing to him. at the foot of the cross. On Calvary, we see the inner reality and the archetype of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, namely the bloody, life-giving passion of the Son of God, by whose stripes we are healed, by whose blood we are cleansed of our sins, by whose body offered up we are made into a sweet-smelling oblation. St. John devotes two austere verses in his gospel to the little flock, the congregation gathered at Golgotha. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore had seen his mother and the disciples standing whom he loved, he saith to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. After that, he saith to to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own. John chapter 19. Let us note several things about this scene. First, neither Mary's name nor John's is mentioned, but only woman and the disciple whom he loved. This stresses their anonymity, They are veiled in the presence of the awful mystery. They are subsumed into it. They lose themselves in Christ. As St. Paul says, you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. The account says they are standing at the foot of the cross. Since we are not to read this passage as a blueprint for an actual liturgy, one cannot conclude that we ought to be standing throughout Mass, although our Byzantine brethren do stand during the liturgy, but for a different reason, because they are celebrating the resurrection, the anastasis, or standing up again. Here at Golgotha, standing signifies attentiveness, a giving of oneself completely to the reality present. Mary and John are, to use a wonderful old expression, assisting at the Lord's sacrifice. They do so not by speaking or singing or moving around, but by being present to Jesus in the depths of their soul. 
What we see then is the platonic form of participatio actuosa, or active participation, entering into the mystery in a way that is not primarily external or physical, but interior and metaphysical. This is not to say, of course, that there should be no outward actions, words, and songs. I could hardly say that being a choir director. It does show us, however, that the proper stance of those assisting at Mass is one of Marian receptivity and Johannine contemplation, and that the visible and audible signs used in the liturgy, as well as the bodily actions by which we respond to them, should be in service of this Marian Johannine adoration of the Lamb and hospitality to the bridegroom. When St. Luke tells us that Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart, he confides to us the very secret of Our Lady's matchless participation in the mysteries of Christ. Indeed, she tells us herself, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. As if to underline that her praise of God is interior, hidden in the depths of her soul and spirit, and by a kind of overflow bursts forth into the great hymn of the Magnificat. In a journal of private revelations recently published with ecclesiastical approval, our Lord speaks the following words. I offered myself to the Father from the altar of my mother's sorrowful and immaculate heart. She accepted, consenting to bear the full weight of my sacrifice, to be the very place from which my holocaust of love blazed up. She, in turn, offered herself with me to the Father from the altar of my sacred heart. There she immolated herself, becoming one victim with me for the redemption of the world. Her offering was set ablaze in my holocaust by the descent of the Holy Spirit. Thus, from our two hearts become two altars, there rose the sweet fragrance of one single offering. My oblation upon the altar of her heart and her oblation upon the altar of mine. This, in effect, is what is meant when, using another language, you speak of my mother as co-redemptrix. Our two hearts formed but a single holocaust of love in the Holy Spirit. This remarkable passage places emphasis on the unity of the sacrifice of Christ and his mother, the account in St. John's Gospel, while it testifies to that unity, also portrays the difference between the principal agent, Christ, the eternal priest, the eternal high priest, and the members of his body, Mary and John. They too are offering the unblemished lamb, but not in the same way in which he is offering it in his very person, in agony on the gibbet. John is a priest, to be sure, but this one time on Good Friday he is assisting in choir, Mary, too, as we have seen, is greater than any priest, but she does not dare to compete with the high priestly act of her son. In fact, she would never take upon herself the gift and mystery that Jesus bestowed on his apostles when he made them priests, namely, the power of acting in persona Christi Capitis, on behalf of Christ, the head of the church. As Theotokos, she is greater than that priestly role, Yet during her pilgrimage on earth, she willingly subordinates herself to it out of reverence for her son, whose image is borne by the priest. In the beginning, Mary received Jesus directly from the Father, but after the institution of the Most Holy Eucharist, Mary received Jesus from the hands of John when he gave her Holy Communion until the time of her Assumption. The trio of Jesus, Mary, and John at the cross is the Church's liturgical life in its primordial form and perennial source, and we see in it the Mysterium Fidei, the mystery of sacrifice, charity, handing over, and continuity, of motherhood and sonship, of unity and diversity, of anticipation, consummation, and perpetuation. Everything that is right about the traditional liturgical practice of the Church, her orthodoxy in its original meaning, may be found exemplified in this icon. Everything that is wrong with contemporary praxis in its confusing tangle of artificial archaeologisms, novelties, deformations, banalities, and overall dullness or flatness 
finds here at the foot of the cross its bitter but health-giving medicine, the cure of a severe mercy that cuts off our foolish experiments. Our Lord is asking us today to imitate the prodigal son who, having wasted his great inheritance, his patrimony, woke up from his stupor and returned to his father who reestablished him in the family with a lavish sacramental feast. We can highlight one last aspect of Calvary. There may have been a certain amount of background noise, the rough talk of Roman soldiers casting dice for garments, the occasional jeering of a scribe or a Pharisee. But the impression one gets from reading the gospel accounts of the Passion is that of an eerie stillness, a pervasive silence that wrapped itself around the mountain like the dark cloud of Sinai. When Jesus speaks, it is a voice cutting through the silence, sounding the deep thoughts of crucified love, like a cataract of water splitting the rock of hard hearts and saturating the tissue of soft hearts. One is reminded of the atmosphere of a private low mass or a solemn high mass in the traditional Roman rite. There is a sovereign stillness in the former and a majestic authoritative utterance in the latter that forces one to pay attention. O vos omnes, qui transitis per viam, attendite et videte. O all ye that pass by the way, attend and see. We can be certain that there was not a lot of didactic chatter going on at the foot of the cross. Mary of Cleophas, would you come and do the first reading? John over here will do the responsorial psalm. You don't have to worry about that. Let's gather around and announce our petitions. We could even ask these soldiers here to come and join us. And you, John and Mary, shake hands and say shalom. There is something tremendously disturbing about the Martha-like busyness, the lack of focus and sonority, and the almost Anaxagorean mixture of roles that characterize the Reformed liturgy. As Cardinal Sara has recently reminded us, and many other imploring voices over the years could be added to his, a Roman rite liturgy without substantial silence that emerges from within its very structure and spirituality is a liturgy that fails to confront us with the mystery of God, fails to integrate us in ourselves as sons of God, and fails to connect us with each other as members of his mystical body. Pope Benedict the, Pope Benedict the 16th says, only in silence can the word of God find a home in us as it did in Mary, woman of the word, and inseparably woman of silence. Our liturgies must facilitate this attitude of authentic listening, verbo crescent, verba deficiunt. When the word of God increases, the words of men fail. That's Benedict the Sixteenth. I would add that when liturgy is bereft of the sober inebriation that arises from the use of Gregorian chant, and in general, when liturgy is deprived of the splendor veritatis of beauty that befits it, we are far less likely to be stirred out of our complacent secularity or pacified in our noisy agitation. Lacking the resources of tradition to engage our senses, imagination, and intellect, we may attend the banquet, but miss out completely on the sweetest and headiest wine, which is tasted only in meditation and contemplation. The wedding at Cana. We all know the story of the wedding feast at Cana the huge embarrassment about to occur if it becomes known that the wine has run out, the gentle intervention of Our Lady, the provision of copious amounts of the best wine by Our Lord's first public miracle. We stand to learn a, num we stand to learn a number of things from Cana. Notice the marvelous attentiveness of Mary, her eye for detail, her mindfulness of what is happening around her. They have no more wine, she says to her son quite simply, without panic or loquacity. She is completely present to the people, the celebration, the needs of the moment. In this, she exemplifies for us that when we are celebrating the mystery of our Lord's marriage with the church on the cross, a mystery made present in the holy sacrifice of the mass, we too must strive to be attentive, mindful, careful, 
totally present to what we are doing, so that we may give due honor to the Lord and receive from him an ever greater understanding of the ceremonies, the gestures and words, the ministers and the things they work with, so that our love of the bridegroom might be intensified. There is an old saying, age quod agis, that is, really do what you are doing. Give it your whole heart and mind. When we approach the altar, when we assist at Mass, we should bring to it this Marian disposition of total availability. For ministers in the sanctuary, this obviously means knowing your role as well as you can and focusing on what you are doing as you are doing it in an intelligent and prayerful spirit. For laity in the pews, it means preparing well for Mass, learning more about the liturgy and making an effort to pray it so that you can assimilate more fully the spiritual riches it contains. But there is a further lesson at Cana too, one that is still more pertinent to our times. Our Lady notices the problem of the moment. They have no more wine. She has, one might say, correctly interpreted the signs of the times. The families who planned the wedding, no doubt people of goodwill with the best of intentions, messed up in their calculations. Their attempt at celebration is rushing towards failure, and only the Lord can save it from disaster. So too, at the time of the Second Vatican Council, the bishops planned a wedding of Catholicism with modernity, and the liturgical reform devised a new type of celebration so as to involve the guests more actively in the drinking and dancing. We may assume plenty of goodwill, but with all the good intentions in the world, all the good intentions in the world do not of themselves guarantee good wine. The good wine of orthodoxy, which means right worship as well as right doctrine. The conciliar wedding feast, which had been billed as a new Pentecost, quickly ran out of wine in the post-conciliar period to the humiliation and consternation of all, including Pope Paul VI, who lamented on June 29, 1972, that, quote, from some fissure the smoke of Satan has entered the temple of God, unquote. Vast numbers of guests have long since fled the feast. What then is to be done? First, we must admit that Our Lady's diagnosis is, is exactly correct for us, too. They have no more wine. Our calculations, our modernizations have failed, and we desperately need help from a different source than the aggiornamento on which we had relied. Second, she says to us, as she said to the servants at Cana, whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. As with her great fiat, we find in these words a lucid reflection of the spotless mirror that is Mary's soul, she who always does what he says, who always submits to whatever he demands, even when it costs her everything. She knows that her son can supply the way forward, can provide the new wine that is urgently needed. And what will the Lord say to his church today? Whatsoever he says, do ye. He will say what he has said to her in every age with merciful clarity and consistency. He will speak nothing other than the very word of God, which is contained in scripture and tradition without any attenuation diminution, distortion, or extraneous elaboration. This is the wine that is new, not because it was made just a few minutes ago, but because it flows from the new Adam, the new song. It is perennially fresh, eternally true, delighting the taste of the inward man. It never goes sour, and one never tires of drinking it. Whatsoever he says in scripture and tradition, this we must do must believe, internalize, and act upon without fear of what others will say or think. If the Lord says that marrying someone who is already married is adultery, which can never be allowed, we will accept it without contradiction. If the Lord says that riches are a danger to the soul and that we are not to seek after them, we will embrace his poverty and not promote unbridled capitalism. If the Lord says that all power in heaven and on earth has been given to him and that we are to make disciples of all nations, we will accept his kingship over individuals, families, societies, and states, and not dabble with the poison of liberalism and its axiom of the necessary separation of church and state, which St. Pius X condemned as a thesis absolutely false, a most pernicious error. Most importantly, 
because it touches most intimately on his very flesh and blood, soul and divinity. We will accept, embrace, and revere his holy mysteries as they have been handed down to us in the liturgical rites of Holy Mother Church, rites organically developed over the centuries under the unfailing guidance of his Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, as it says in the epistle to the Hebrews. And he speaks to us the same word yesterday and today and forever, the infallible and inerrant word of scripture and the unshakable foundation of apostolic tradition expressed through and supported by ecclesiastical traditions that the church had always venerated until her leaders, caught up in the antinomian spirit of the 1960s, succumbed to the allurements of modernity. Let us dwell for a moment on this last point, namely the historically famous veneration of the Church of Rome for its own heritage, the jealousy of Rome for its rites and doctrines, to which we may compare the attitude of Eastern Christians towards the Byzantine divine liturgy and the testimony of the Church Fathers. It seems to me that this is simply the ecclesial translation of the innermost spirituality of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Note well how much is packed into that first phrase. She kept all these things, held on to them for dear life, and did not dare to discard them. She kept all these things. She did not sort through them and chuck out what didn't suit her, or bothered her, or challenged her, or baffled her, but preserved them all in her heart, in her prayer, in her life. She kept all these things. In the, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, one does not engage in a generic keeping, a receiving of just anything, it matters not what. Rather, one keeps these things, the deeds of God on behalf of Israel and the mysteries of Christ on behalf of mankind. It is a specific preservation of what has been concretely given. It is like one's proper name, the name that expresses the irreducible singularity and mystery of the individual person. The mother of God is named by her parents Mary, not the eternal feminine or the earth goddess. Her son is named Jesus, not redeemer or moral teacher or hero or ideal. Instead of looking to Mary, our mother, and imitating her tenacious keeping, we have looked too much to, the, to modernity, the spirit of which is not merely in tension with, but contrary to Mary's virtues. What she keeps and ponders is ultimately her son, eternal and incarnate wisdom, in all the richness of his individuality, the scandal of his particularity. For this reason, Buddhists or Muslims cannot receive and keep as Mary did, and as we ought to do. They ponder things, to be sure, but these things are either errors or half-truths. They are not the deeds of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the mysteries of God incarnate, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of Israel. What is true for the Blessed Virgin Mary is true for all Catholics. We have a concrete historical tradition, not a jumble of generalities, platitudes, and ideals. Our traditional Catholic practices emphasize this fact. Kneeling, while intelligible as a sign in itself, also relates to the humble adoration of the Magi and St. Mary of Bethany anointing the feet of Jesus. Ad Orientem worship, while intelligible as a cosmic symbol, points to the transcendent God who has revealed himself to Israel as a thrice holy consuming fire and as the Orient who breaks in upon the world and will return from the East. The same combination of universal intelligibility and the scandal of the particular is found in the great historic liturgies of East and West. Coming to birth in a particular place, time, and culture, they are highly definite, individualized, unmistakably what they are and nothing else. And over the centuries, they develop a characteristic depth, a sort of personality, owing to the various influences that act upon them. At the same time, they show a remarkable capacity to be transplanted by missionaries to new places, times, and cultures where they captivate and shape new peoples for Christ. The very density of their substance contains and conveys the religious signs to which man was created to respond by the grace of God acting on his natural faculties. 
In their variety, the traditional Eastern and Western liturgical rites give polyphonic utterance to the unity, holiness, Catholicity, and apostolicity of the Church. Each has its peculiar strengths. No one of them can be mistaken for any other. Once they have solidified, as it were, into their final forms, one does not attempt to mix them. One does not mix up the Byzantine and the Roman, or the Roman, the Ambrosian, and the Mozarabic. Each has to be respected for the specific concrete tradition it embodies. Those who belong to a certain rite enjoy the privilege and the duty of receiving it, caring for it, preserving it, and passing it on to their descendants. Now, as Roman Catholics, we inherit the Roman rite. This rite is the most ancient of all, going back to a period so early that there was not yet any dispute among Christians about the divinity of the Holy Spirit, which explains the lack of an epiclesis in the Roman canon. The epiclesis is the invocation of the Holy Spirit in the Eucharistic prayer. It was simply not needed. The entire theology of consecration is different. For the early Christians in Rome, it was enough to ask the Father to do something because he is pleased with the Son. If the Father grants his paternal blessing, the effect follows irresistibly. It was only later, in response to the Eastern heresy of Macedonianism, that Byzantine Christians thought it desirable to invoke the Divine Spirit to bring about the conversion of the gifts. The mid-20th century fad of introducing epicletic prayers into Western liturgies, and even worse, of creating new anaphoras where they had never existed before, reflects not only recklessly irresponsible scholarship, but a profound betrayal of the apostolic tradition of these liturgies. We are dealing once again with an anti-Marian stance. Rather than keeping all these particular things that the Lord has entrusted to us, including an epiclesis-free anaphora, we pick and choose, mix and match, invent and discard. If, therefore, we wish to be like Mary, Catholics of the Roman Rite should receive keep and ponder the Roman rite as it has developed organically over time, since it is the embodiment for us of the deeds of God and the mysteries of Christ. It is our liturgical scandal of the particular. Just as Jesus was not every man or no man, but this male Israelite, born of the house of David in Bethlehem, reared in the village of Nazareth, a mendicant preacher who was put to death as a malefactor by Roman authorities, so too the Roman rite is not an open-ended, infinitely malleable structure for liturgical experimentation, but a rite of truly noble simplicity that originated in a tiny area of Italy and grew slowly but surely into a magnificent tree bedecked with Gallican ornaments. It is, in other words, perfectly and absolutely itself and nothing else. Its unique canon, its ancient lectionary, its cycle of propers and orations, its calendar, all these things make it to be itself and nothing else. Consequently, the rejection, manipulation, or transmogrification of this rite by Roman Catholics is nothing less than an act of violence against their own identity, a kind of institutional suicide. Since the evolution of liturgical rites is always under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and it cannot be maintained by any faithful Catholic that the Holy Spirit was absent from the Church for the 400 years between the promulgation of the Missal of Pius V and the promulgation of the Missal of Paul VI, much less that he was absent from the development of the liturgy from St. Gregory the Great down to the Council of Trent, it follows that the liturgical reform as it took place under Annibale Bunini, tainted by a combination of antiquarian and modernist principles, rejected the scandal of the particular, disowned the concrete historic tradition of Catholicism, forsook the theology of the Council of Trent, and in all of these ways offended the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, who entrusts himself to us through the authentic rites and traditions of the universal church. The meltdown, the hardships, the crises through which the Catholic Church has passed since the Second Vatican Council are divine chastisement for this act of unprecedented hubris against organic continuity with the apostolic rite of Rome. He hath scattered the proud in the conceit of their heart. This, I believe, would be Our Lady's commentary. I spoke earlier of a marriage between the church and modernity. Fortunately, every metaphor has its limitations. 
The church is not actually wedded to modernity. The church is wedded to Jesus Christ. But in recent decades, it would seem that all too many church leaders have attempted a second marriage, wishing to exchange the sweet yoke of Christ for the harsh burden of intellectual fashion, the ever-elusive relevance that leads to supreme irrelevance. For 50 years, we have seen an embarrassing infatuation with modernity, an ill-starred romance. And as with all extramarital liaisons, this one too must come to an end. In this season of grace, the Lord Jesus is calling his church on earth to return once more with humility and repentance to her first love. He waits patiently for her conversion from the vain pursuit of worldly idols to the stability of sacred tradition. In conclusion, I would like to make a brief remark about the current situation of the church. It is hardly coincidental that the tremendous moral and doctrinal crisis through which the church is now passing, where some of her shepherds are calling into question fundamental truths about marriage and the family, is occurring in a body of believers who have been habituated by 50 years of liturgical change into thinking that the most sacred mysteries, the most awesome realities of our faith, are subject to our control, our desires, our better ideas, our duty to modernize everything in a vertiginous adjournamento. Such attitudes and the reforms that enshrined them have contributed to a loss of basic reverence towards mysteries received, such as human life, the love of man and woman, the once for all redeeming death of Christ on the cross, the sacraments of the church, and time-honored liturgical rites. If we cannot revere our own tradition which is the result of so many centuries of prayer, devotion, piety, and intelligence operating under the influence of the Holy Spirit, why should we revere anything that is said to be a given? Natural law stands or falls with divine law, and our apprehension of nature itself stands or falls with our acceptance of the true Christian religion. If we desire the restoration of good morals, we must first restore the virtue of religion the foremost of moral virtues, by which we offer God fitting worship along the path of tradition. By doing this, we signify our intention to surrender ourselves to him as our first beginning and last end. We abandon the enlightenment folly of taking ourselves as the point of origin and arrival. Within the safety of the church's tradition, in the intimate encounter with the glorified Christ who suffered for our sins, we will find again the illumination and the strength to live righteously. Our Blessed Lady shows us the best way, the true way, the holy way. It begins with, be it done unto me according to thy word, culminates in her adoring and co-redemptive silence at the foot of the cross, lingers lovingly in her life of Eucharistic communion, and finds completion in her glorious assumption where she, the very personification of the heavenly Jerusalem and its ineffable liturgy, is taken up by the hand of her son and led into his eternal wedding feast. Let us follow her with all our hearts as we walk confidently in the Marian spirit and power of the traditional Latin liturgy. Thank you for your kind attention.